Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute of Justice. James Wilson. When people are threatened by crime or disorder, they usually turn to the police. They assume the police will know what to do. But do they? How can the police most effectively combat crime and reduce disorder while at the same time treating cit citizens fairly and living within the police budget? For a long time, what the police did depended mostly on the lessons of experience modified by various expert opinions as to what constituted good police work. There was a kind of conventional wisdom about what works in policing. Some examples. Patrolling a city's streets in marked police cars prevents crime. Responding rapidly to citizen calls for service greatly increases the chances that an arrest will be made. Assigning two officers to each patrol car makes the officers safer and enables them to do better police work. Mediating a violent quarrel between husband and wife or referring the quarreling parties to social agencies is a better method of handling family disputes than arresting the assailant. These assumptions sound sensible, but are they? How do we know these methods really work? The answer, you test them in experiments. In this program, we are going to show you three such experiments. Each will be described by a person involved in the project. They are George Kelling, professor of criminal justice at Northeastern University. Richard Stauffenberger, former assistant director of the Police Foundation. And Joel Garner, program manager at the National Institute of Justice. The first major police experiment in modern times took place in Kansas City, Missouri in the early 1970s. Its purpose, to find out if preventive patrol really prevented anything. Here in Baltimore County, as in most departments throughout the country, officers periodically patrol and check crime-prone locations. I think that I would feel safer with somebody patrolling and knowing somebody was out there in case something happened. But the value of routine patrols, traditionally believed to cut crime and promote a sense of citizen safety, was questioned by the Kansas City study. Three separate but similar geographic areas were defined. One was given no police presence, one had the normal level of patrol, and a third had two to three times the normal patrol level. After a year, statistics from the three areas were compared. The study showed that routine preventive patrol in marked police cars had very little effect on crime or on promoting a sense of citizen security. There were no fewer burglaries, car thefts, robberies, or vandalism in areas with increased patrols than in areas without patrols. There were no differences in how citizens and businessmen viewed police and police services, or in citizens' fear of crime. There were no differences in the anti-crime measures taken by citizens in those three areas. Here to discuss this with me is George Kelling, one of the persons who carried out the Kansas City experiment. George, how is it that the Kansas City Police Department ever came to question the conventional wisdom? Well, during the early 1970s, uh, the Kansas City uh, Police Department suddenly received 320 new recruits. And Chief Kelly, interested, who was chief of police in Kansas City at the time, was interested in determining what was the best way to allocate those uh, new police officers. And he brought in some consultants to work with the command staff. And after a series of meetings, we simply didn't know how to best allocate them. Um, some people believe that they should back up regular patrol cars, that they should uh, increase preventive patrol. And 
so finally, almost out of frustration, uh, Chief Kelly created three task forces, one in each of the three districts in Kansas City. In the South Patrol Task Force, the officers uh, worked out a plan where, uh, uh, to deal with juvenile delinquency. But a debate began amongst the officers, the Lion Patrol officers, and that was some believed that you could remove the officers to do these special tasks, and others believed that preventive patrol was so effective in fighting crime that the officers had to be used to beef up the patrol force. And so that debate finally led to a suggestion out of the Kansas City officers themselves that they experiment with, with levels, of, uh, levels of preventive patrol. And that's where you became involved? Yes. At that time, I was working for the Police Foundation, and I was brought in. Of course, it was a researcher's dream. Here were a group of police officers who were questioning whether or not something worked, wanted to experiment with it and uh, ask me for technical assistance to um, um, establish the experiment. Now, were these experimental conditions really followed? I mean, you remove all preventive patrol from a given area. Could you really keep the officers out of that area? Well, uh, uh, Jim, you raise an area about which there's been some, about, about which there's been some controversy. Uh, yes, we largely kept the officers out of those areas. At first, they wanted to get back in the areas. One condition that they could go back in was serving warrants. And, uh, Officers in Kansas City decided that at that time that they had to serve a lot of warrants, and so we had to essentially we stopped the experiment and started again. But we had four observers, uh, four civilian observers, plus two police observers who were riding patrol all the time during the length of the experiment. And generally, we estimate that at, at, uh, the experiment was adhered to at about 85 percent, uh, at about an 85 percent level. The mistake that I made was uh, not to quantify those judgments uh, uh, that the observers made and present them in the final and present them in the final report. But you're satisfied that the experimental conditions by and large were maintained? We met two to three times a week, the observers, myself, uh, other staff members, to discuss what's going on where, what officers aren't adhering to the experimental conditions. So we were keeping tab, uh, tab all the time. Now the other side of that question is if you keep officers from doing random preventive patrol in a certain neighborhood, doesn't that increase the length of time it takes them to respond to a citizen call for service? And doesn't that, in turn, reduce the chance of an arrest? Well, it might increase the time that it takes, but it turns out there's been additional research about uh, rapid response to calls for service. And that, too, is an intuitively reasonable uh, police approach. But it turns out that what we've discovered since that time, other researchers, I shouldn't say we, it was other researchers discovered, was that even if the police get there in, say, three minutes, it doesn't make much difference because in the vast majority of the cases, and with good reason, citizens wait 20 to 40 minutes before they call the police. And so just being out there riding around in cars doesn't seem to have a lot of value. Now, how did the city of Kansas City or other cities or other police departments react to this finding? Well, most of them, unfortunately, came to the wrong conclusion. The conclusion was that they could do with fewer police officers. And in city after city, they wanted to, uh, they wanted to move on by cutting back on, on, on the size of the police department. The study, didn't, uh, the study didn't look at that. The study looked at the tactics of prevent, the tactic of preventive patrol, not the number of police officers, because there were many other things police can be doing. But at a minimum, you said that the police may be wasting their time if they're driving around waiting for something to happen. How should they be using their time? Well, there's been research about that, too. Uh, it turns out that we discover that if the police want to increase the number of apprehensions, the best thing is to be out in neighborhoods collecting information. And that is, uh, we know now that information is, is practically the only way good information properly handled is the only way that police can improve their arrest record. We know that foot patrol reduces fear. We know that there are other things now that are starting to make a difference in cities to improve the quality of life for citizens. And if you took those things into account, it may be that some cities need more police officers, not fewer. Precisely. Thank you very much. Our second experiment tested the idea that it was better to advise or counsel individuals who assaulted their spouses than it was to arrest them or send them away from home. This experiment was done in Minneapolis in the early 1980s. Police and fire emergency. Okay, what I want is a battered woman. You are a battered woman? Yes. Who assaulted you? My ex, 
Uh, not my ex, but it's my fiance. All right. Does he? Did he have any weapons, or did he just use no, his hands? No, just use his fist. All right. He does not have any weapons. No. Are there any in the house? He's in the house, and I'm scared. Is he in the house? Yes, and I'm scared. When police responded to domestic violence calls, a lottery determined which of the three methods would be used to deal with the attacker. Arrest, send away for eight hours, or mediate and give advice. Can I just talk to you? Can I just talk to you now without, without all this noise? Just right here. So all this noise here. Police traditionally have resisted involvement in domestic disputes, feeling that offenders will not be punished by the courts even if arrested, and that the problems can't be solved anyway. Well, you know where you're going. The results of the study were dramatic. In minor assault cases, arrest was by far the most effective of the three methods in reducing future violence. Only 10% repeat violence in six months, as compared to 19% for assaulters who are given advice and 24% for those assaulters sent out of the house. If police also took the time to listen to the victim's story, the occurrence of repeat violence, as reported by the victim, is reduced even further. Here to discuss this with me is Joel Garner, who is familiar with this project. Joel, many police officers don't like to get involved in domestic yes. disputes and probably don't like to make arrests. In Minneapolis, did you find that officers resisted participating in this experiment? Well, officers in the experiment volunteered to participate. This was not all the officers throughout the city of Minneapolis. Even among those that did volunteer, only a, a portion of those actually contributed cases to the experiment. So there was some resistance, but there was also cooperation and interest on the part of officers. Do you think that the fact that some officers didn't contribute cases might bias the results? Uh... Well, that is possible, and, and we don't know the extent to which that biased the, the, the results. We know, do know that of the cases we receive, what the results were, but we don't know how well those cases reflect all the cases that officers encounter in Minneapolis or St. Paul or any place else in the country. What should be done next? Should we take this as the last word or is there more work to be done? No. More research is to be done. And we are doing more research in other jurisdictions to see whether the effects that were uncovered in Minneapolis are true in other jurisdictions, with other types of cases, with other types of treatments. We only tried individual treatments in Minneapolis, but in other replications of this experiment, we are trying arrest with counseling or sending people out of the house with counseling to see whether there are interaction effects or combined influences of these different types of treatments. Now, to go back to the Minneapolis project, you compared, or the researchers compared, uh, arrest, social work help, and being uh, moved out of the house. Now, what did it mean uh, to say that they had social work help. Did they really get any such help? Well, that is one of the, the things that is unclear about Minneapolis. What that is is what the, pe the police involved in the experiment in Minneapolis call counseling. This may be different in other jurisdictions. They were trained, some of them, in advising the parties, trying to calm the dispute, and it's leaving the, the household. That may be different in many other jurisdictions, and that's one of the things we're trying to get at in replications. What does counseling mean? What type of counseling? How much? Who should deliver that counseling? And it's conceivable that in a repetition of this that looked more closely at a meaningful counseling program, the benefits of counseling might rise, the benefits of arrest might fall. We don't know yet. Is that, that right? That is correct. It, arrest in Minneapolis, in almost all the cases, meant a night in jail. It was not just you're arrested, sent down to the station house, and you're released immediately. It was a real um, time in jail. A, connected with that arrest. Did the sanction ever involve much more than just a night in jail? No. Of all the cases involved in the experiment, where there was an arrest, only three ever ended up in court. So it's only arrest, a night in jail, no further criminal justice uh, involvement in the cases. Now, on what legal grounds did an officer make an arrest on, on his own authority? Usually, as I understand it, simple assaults are misdemeanors. And misdemeanors uh, do not result in an arrest if the crime did not take place in the officer's presence or unless there's a complaining witness. That has been the case in many U.S. states. Minneapolis, just prior to this research, changed the law to authorize the police to make arrests in misdemeanor assault cases that they did not witness. They this, used what, a probable cause they standard? They used a probable cause standard. 
there was something in the situation that they determined assault had occurred. So they, they could make an arrest even though the woman, who was the typical victim, didn't sign a complaint on the spot. That is correct. Now, that is only true in something like 22 states in the United States. Many states, the police are not authorized to make that arrest. So they cannot do that. Arresting uh, men who assault their spouses or wives is a new departure, uh, and in some quarters a controversial one. What groups spoke out in favor of or opposed to this new policy in Minnesota? Well, the, the result of the experiment was uh, uh, favorably received by uh, uh, victim rights groups, feminist groups who have often argued that the police should make arrests and that they should protect victims, and the way to do that is by making an arrest. Other people who have in the past have argued that the police should not make an arrest, that they cannot be effective, uh, have argued for referring these cases to social service agencies for alcohol treatment, for drug treatment, um, and, and the results have been controversial along those lines. Some people support the results, others think more research is necessary. Let me look a little bit at the measure uh, the researchers used of the success of the project. They said that on the basis of follow-up interviews, the wives or lovers of the men who had been arrested were much less likely to be victimized in the future than were uh, the wives of men who had been not arrested. Now, isn't it the case that some of the wives whose husbands had been arrested were simply intimidated by the husbands? The husband sent a night in jail. He was mad as the dickens when he got home, and the wife was unwilling to report any more uh, abuses. Uh, that's possible, and that was one of the concerns of the research. To, to get at that, we used more than one measure, one outcome measure. We also looked at official police reports. In addition, we found that often the victim is not the person who calls the police, but a neighbor or a friend is the one who calls the police. And for that reason, we think that the results are reliable because we have more than one measure of outcome. Thank you. Our final example tested the idea that two officer patrol cars are safer and more productive than one officer cars. This experiment took place in San Diego in the mid-1970s. Realistically, in today's age, with everybody getting budget cuts, it's not practical or cost-effective any longer to even consider the proposition of having two-man cars. This Baltimore County police officer echoes the concerns of most departments today. Routine two-man patrols have been eliminated in most jurisdictions because of budget limitations. San Diego found that it could put 18 single-man units on the streets for the same price as 10 two-man units, a savings of 83% a year if the whole department converted. But would that financial savings mean a sacrifice of quality police work? The one-year study comparing one- and two-man routine patrols concluded that one-officer units provide equal performance and increased officer safety, as well as significant cost savings. One-officer units show more arrests and formal crime reports, fewer citizen complaints, and equal overall performance ratings. Single officer units also measure up better in cost per minute efficiency, providing equivalent amounts of activity at lower costs. Surprisingly, single officers are safer. The study shows they are less frequently assaulted or involved with individuals resisting arrest. 444, 1063. But most officers continue to feel that everything works better when two officers ride together. I think that the citizenry would get a better response having uh, two officers there. I think it makes you a little bit more confident in yourself. You'll have somebody there to back you up immediately instead of having to depend on the communication system. Although the officers prefer double patrol, particularly those who are less experienced or are patrolling in dangerous areas, the study showed that for routine patrol, it's cheaper and equally efficient to give single officers shotguns or police dogs rather than to double them up. Here to discuss this with me is Richard Stauffenberger, former assistant director of the Police Foundation. Dick, I don't think many viewers will be surprised to learn that having one officer in a car makes it cheaper than having two officers in a car, but I think a lot of people will be surprised to hear that a one officer car is safer. How can that be? 
We're, we're unsure, Jim. When we looked at it, we obviously measured officer injuries, resisting arrest. Uh, before we entered into it, there was a lot of folklore. Some of the folks thought that uh, two officers would make it less uh, safe. Their argument was that two officers would create a situation that the macho image, uh, an officer would actually uh, cause uh, a situation to get out of hand. Uh, apparently, from the resisting arrest reports, there were more resisting arrests. So two officers indeed did uh, make the uh, situation less safe than one officer. Are you saying that a one officer car involves a single individual less willing or less likely to take chances or to exceed authority? Uh, not necessarily, but perhaps uh, less apt to move a situation from a situation that violence would not occur into a situation to create violence. Could that be a danger? Could it be the case that an officer being alone in a car is unwilling to do things he might be willing to do with a partner and thus be in some subtle, hard-to-measure way less effective as a police officer? That could be, but we also measure effectiveness in a number of uh, criteria. And in virtually everything from arrests to field interrogations, uh, with the one exception being traffic citations, the single officer's car and the, and the uh, two officers in a car performed equally as well. Now, some people will say, well, San Diego is a pretty tame place. A lot of retired admirals and uh, elderly citizens, but you can't tell me that one officer cars will be safer in Detroit or New York or Philadelphia. What's your reaction? You'd have to ask the San Diego police officers how tame San Diego is. When we looked at the uh, city of San Diego, we measured various uh, areas of the city. So we took tough areas and we took uh, not so tough areas. Areas that have traditionally had two officer patrol cars in San Diego were switched to one. So in terms of the makeup, some of the areas were fairly high crime areas. Uh, obviously in any social science experiment like this you don't know how well you can translate uh, the results into another city. It depends on uh, the characteristics of the city, the environment, the type of uh, training the officers had, and a lot of other uh, criteria. The last officer we interviewed on the tape that you saw expressed some reservations about the findings, that he felt better in a two-officer car. What was in general the reaction of the San Diego Police Department to this? Most felt better in a two-officer patrol car. And indeed, as the study moved along, we took three attitude surveys uh, in San Diego at three different times. And uh, as the study moved along, the officers increasingly felt better with two officer patrol cars. Younger officers felt better with uh, two officer patrol cars. My, my view would be the same kind of uh, folklore that uh, affected uh, officers before the study was still affecting them. I'm sure they felt safer. It seemed, it's kind of a common sense approach that you must be safer with uh, two officers in a car than one officer. And there's a, uh, a sociological, well, I think people would rather have someone to talk with, a partner, somebody to be with, rather than being alone in the car. What did the San Diego Police Department do with these results? Did they switch the two officer cars to one officer cars? Uh, I have not kept up with the San Diego Police Department since then, uh, so I really don't know, Jim. Do you think this uh, finding about the effectiveness and safety of one officer cars has had a large or small or no impact on policing generally? It's had some impact because the costs are absolutely astonishing in terms of the difference. You're talking about a, you mentioned 83 percent, but per hour to put a two officer patrol car out it was $28 an hour in those days. Uh, putting out two single officer patrol cars was $30 an hour. And so uh, the cost of putting two out uh, is not a heck of a lot more than putting out two and one. And since the 1970s, police budgets have come under increasing constraint. They're tighter. There are some departments that have even laid off officers. Are they, as far as you know, responding by trying to make greater use of one officer cars? I think so, but there's still some uh, cities that we uh, continue to see uh, large numbers of two officer patrol cars. It's built into the mythology of those cities. It's built into uh, union contracts, and uh, I don't think we're seeing uh, major changes in some of the cities that have had uh, a tradition of two officer patrol cars. You're saying with respect to union contracts that some off unions representing police officers insist that there be two officer cars as a condition of employment. That's written yes. into the contract. Yeah. Uh, do police departments ever try to challenge that and try oh, to get out of it? I would suspect, but, uh, but police not departments having... have the same problems with employee organizations. If you were else. a police officer and you were patrolling in the inner part of a city, would you prefer to be in a one or two officer car? 
I think I'd prefer to be in a two-officer patrol car. I think I would like the interaction with another officer. It's not an either-or, though. I think what you have to look at is how often do the calls in a particular section of the city require backup. If, indeed, the backup is being required 80% of the time, it probably is better to have two officer patrol cars. If, indeed, the backup is only be re being required 30% of the time, 25% of the time, it's not. Uh, and it is a dollar and cents issue. You buy, by backup, you mean sending two cars two to the cars. scene of a disturbance sure. to support the officer yeah. who's initially there. Sure. There are going to be sections of the city where uh, a large proportion of the calls may require backup assistance. Thank and you very much, Dick. None of these three experiments on spouse assault, preventive patrol, or one officer, two, one officer or two officer cars conclusively settles the question of how best to deliver police services. The lessons learned in one city may not be applicable to another. Circumstances may change. Further testing is often required. But all three cases teach the same lesson about how we can intelligently work toward improving police service, or any public service. That lesson is this. Don't assume you know what works. Find out. To find out what works, you have to follow certain rules. First, the researcher and the police agency must work closely together to define their goals and design the project. Second, the people or neighborhoods on whom the experiment is performed must be compared to a similar control group that is not involved in the experiment. Third, the best way to assign people or neighborhoods to the experimental group is randomly, by the flip of a coin. Fourth, there must be careful, detailed, before and after measures of conditions within the experimental and the control groups. And fifth, the people evaluating the experiment should be different from those carrying it out. When people evaluate their own work, they tend to find that everything works. Experimental evaluations are not a cure-all for improving the work of the criminal justice system. And some questions cannot be answered by this method. But experimental evaluations, whenever appropriate, are a big help in replacing opinion with knowledge. Thank you for watching. For Crime File and for the Police Foundation, I'm James Wilson. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. This program was produced by the Police Foundation, which is solely responsible for its content.